Today on This Week in Startups, it's time for our news roundtable. Marshall Kirkpatrick is on the Skype. He's the co-editor of Read, Write, Web. Say that five times fast. Rob Tursik uh, is here from the future. He's an interactive content guru uh, who I've known for over a decade. Brilliant guy, and I'm so happy he could join us in studio. Tyler Crowley, the CEO of Squeal, is also uh, remote. I'm going to find out where he's coming from. And Lon Harris, the director of content. How did you get your title into the, the opening? That's, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Director of content for the amazing startup, Ranker.com, is also with us. He'll be reading the news. All that and more right now on This Week in Startups. What it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We've got an incredible news roundtable with us. Rob Tursik is here. Uh, Rob is an old friend uh, who's spoken at many of my conferences in the past. Uh, most recently worked at the, can I say that? You worked over at the uh, Oprah, Winfrey Network. Oprah Winfrey Network. Yeah. Consults for a lot of people. Rob, welcome to the program. Thanks. Happy to be here. How do you describe yourself these days? Well, they, they dub me a vi digital media visionary when I get a on stage. A DMV. I've been doing a lot of talking around the world. People have invited me to come out and talk. And, uh, You're a great speaker. Well, I'm having fun doing it. I've got to say, there's a lot of cool stuff happening, especially in digital video. Yeah. And uh, so I people mean, want to hear what's happening. Video is huge. Uh, and you, of course, I met you, I think it was Digital Coast 99 or something. Yes, and somehow sir. you came on our radar. And I think it was Shenny who introduced us, possibly. And I was like, she's like, give this guy a chance to speak. Was that one of the first times you'd spoken at an event? Or you, it was early on, yeah. It was early on, and you spoke at the event, and everybody loved you. You became quite a success <laughs> in the Web 1.0 Thanks space. Thanks for that boost. It was, uh, it, well, it's, thanks, Shinny. Uh, Tyler Crowley, where are you calling him from? Wilmington, Delaware. William, in, you're in Delaware, and yeah. I see you have your signature blackout curtains up in your hotel room. Yes. And your blacks. Um, what are you, what's, do I have to have the audience ask which you know, huge conglomerate that Squeal is doing a partnership is in William Art. That's well, in Delaware. No, that's just the the headquarters. The HQ. All right. Well, a lot Marsh of companies set up in Delaware because of the tax. Oh, it's a, a Delaware. Oh, you're actually it's a Delaware corporation, Absolutely. and you're actually. See, by the way, Tyler. Yes. You need to talk to your lawyer. You don't need to actually be in Delaware to be a Delaware corporation. That's <laughs> oh, just a. Yeah, yeah. I'll you have, got it wrong. I'll Tyler. have to check. I'll have to check in on that. God, Tyler. <laughs> I know you're a first time CEO, but yeah. you you it's because <laughs> you haven't. A, all right, we'll talk after the show. All right. uh, Marshall Kirkpatrick, thank you so much. I see uh, you're at home because you have the bookshelf behind you. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for trimming the beard as well. How's everything at Read Write Web? Did it just for you. Uh, all is, is real well at Read Write Web. Uh, we're having lots of fun, lots of news to write about, and uh, lots to talk about here today with you. It uh, must be awesome for you guys to watch other uh, tech publications that we will not name become obsessed with either gossip or like celebrity stuff or like tech gossip because you're really one of the few places that actually does real tech journalism today. You must be seeing a boost in traffic. How's the traffic over at Rewrite Web? Oh, it's it's looking good, though I must confess that uh, internally we are proud of the fact that we do make more Justin Bieber jokes than any other leading tech blog online, yeah. and, uh, and we take a, a data-driven approach to, to covering news like that as well. <laughs> Absolutely, but I mean, come on, you, you, read, Ma you read Mashable, you know, and it started in tech, but now Mashable is basically whatever is on Google Trends, they're writing seven stories about it. Right. And then TechCrunch has devolved into like insider jokes and Mike lost his bags, Delta law. Whoever <laughs> lost Mike's lot, bags. It's a lot of I lost whatever, my bags. And it's airlines basically and, yeah. Mike has turned TechCrunch into squeal. Oh, it's it's his own personal He's squeal. Pro, he, I pray thanks to anyone who goats on their blog and screams about yeah, customer, customer service. service. Thank you for doing that. You exactly um, are proving the point. Lon, you're you're yes. settling into your new role as uh, creative director, I director am. of content director over at of Ranker. Content, yes. Um, how's that going? Uh, it's go it's going really well. It's it's a it's a fun site. Uh, people are really enjoying it. We're just focused now on we we know how to get people there. We know how to get people enjoying the lists. 
uh, it's really focused now on how do we get people to make their own lists? How do we get people to vote more on lists? How do we get people to leave comments on lists? Right. That's the real big challenge that we're facing. Now, if people go to ranker.com right now, will they see the list of the news stories listed uh, I think there? It might or do be we... on the front page at all. We have an algorithm that does the front page stories, and it's based on what's getting the most action right now, what's mm. the newest. It's sort of all. So if you see ranking right now. Oh, there it is. Okay, we're ranked yeah. number eight. So, oh, so you're ranking your most popular We're list. ranking our top lists based right. on, and it's uh, on a bunch of different factors like uh, tweets, Facebook likes. Likes, yeah. how many people are voting, all right. that sort of stuff. So if you go to Ranker.com, you'll see Twist, uh, number 139, News Stories, and Ranker is our official news right. aggregator. That's how we get Lon uh, to give up a half day at his and, job. Uh, thousands. We got 1,200 people went to the Twist news page. During the show. No, just all oh, week. before. To help us pick the news stories. That's week. great. And, uh, of course, that's being helped because of the TwistList.co. Everybody go to TwistList.co. It is booming. We now have, I think it might be uh, Twist... Everybody knows what this is, right? Everybody knows about the producer program? No? Okay. Um, essentially, uh, I'm going to pull it up on the screen here. Uh, this is, you're gonna, your head's going to explode, Rob. Um, we uh, have uh, figured out a way to dupe the audience. I'm sorry. Um, to work with the audience to produce the show. Now, like a movie, you could become an executive producer if you sponsor the show for 50 bucks a month. You get put on the secret mailing list. And you get listed as an executive producer, and we're going to actually put this into the IMDb. Now I don't know how many. I, I don't control the IMDb, so they may kick us out. But we're going to make our best effort to put the executive producers in the IMDb, and maybe some of the other producers too. So uh, you're letting them buy their way into internet fame. Well, I mean that's how people do it in the. Uh, but also, what's happening is they're on a private mailing list with me and Lon, and we're having discussions about the show coming up. And at three o'clock today, after this show, we have a private go-to meeting uh, with the producers of the show. So they actually get to be in the pro monthly producers meeting when we you know, evaluate the guests, upcoming guests, previous sure. guests, and how the show's going. For as little as $5 a month, $10 a month, $25 a month, or $50 a month, you can support the show. I think we're up to about $10,000, $12,000. Yeah. Uh, I'm brokering deals right now to go take the show HD. I've got two competing products, the Broadcast Picks Graphite and the mm -hmm. TriCaster 850. These are like the state of, we use TriCaster right now. We're sort of a new tech TriCaster shop, but the broadcast picks guys are coming on pretty strong, right. trying to get us to use their hardware, so I'm doing my little negotiation. Machiavellian, you Who know. Who doesn't want the twist bump? Everybody well, listen, wants everybody bump. wants a twist bump, and now we're going to be in HD, and it's going to be nine, nine or 12 uh, inputs. So essentially, everybody wow. in the room will have a laptop, mm -hmm. and everybody will have their own camera, <laughs> and we could pull up Rob's laptop, Tyler's, and so you could be like, That's oh, look insane. at this, yeah. oh, look at that. It's going to be like boom, 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 boom. Um, and so, so when you're done with this show, you can go run NPR since they won't have any financing for the government. <laughs> no, they're screwed. So you can crowdsource Didn't the we financing. Didn't them already? Hey, and let me just take a chance right here to, uh, to say thank you to the new producers who joined this week. Let's hear a round of applause for them. Uh, Jeffrey Clapp, um, Ian Hyatt, uh, Jeff Hoffner. Are we going to do that sound every time I read their names? I love it. Eli Cooler, Ted uh, Inua, Radic. Ribicki, Hunter Owens, I remember him, uh, Christian Owens, Ben Altieri, Casey Walk, uh, Cam Collins, he's a super fan, Cam Collins, uh, associate producers, Nathan uh, Hanjin and Lori, uh, Han and supporter, uh, Ho Hosea Thomas. So thank you to all you guys for coming in and supporting. That's like a dozen people right there. It's essentially... I don't know, 15 people a week are doing this. It's up to ten dollars or $12,000 in yearly support, you know, if you, if you calculate the things. and um, It's going to work great, and it's going to really help us build this new $70,000 studio that I've got sure. spec'd out, uh, and that's going to make the show even better. Italian sodas. I know we were promised Italian sodas. I remember Look at you with your rider. <laughs> God. But people were very excited about you coming back to the show. And uh, with good cause. Ah, yes. And thank you, thank you, Trotter. Trotter is, of course, uh, the big supporter, advertiser of the show. Trotta is a crowdsourced pay-per-click marketplace. You've heard of SEM, search engine sure, marketing, yeah. before. Hey, that's really hard to do. It takes a lot of experts. It's extremely expensive to do SEM, and they have a thousand paid, more than a thousand paid search experts who are waiting for you to come in and say how much you want to spend, and then they do all the work for you, finding those little keywords that convert the best and convert the lowest price. Uh, these people are impossible to find, especially in today's market. But SEM is very important. If you're a paid search expert and you would like to uh, put your skills to work and make a little extra cheddar, go to Trotta.com and learn how Trotta can help you earn extra income. Yes, all you search engine experts working at different e-commerce companies, you could moonlight. You could close the door and work for Trotta. I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm just saying that that could happen. Uh, new promo from now until June 1st. If you sign up for Trotta and spend a minimum of $3,000, your company is going to receive a free ad on Twist. Wait, who? 
How, I'm going to read a free ad for you. If you spend money with Trada, that's a good idea. Uh, go ahead and sign up. Use the promo code TWIST, and we're going to pick somebody at random and give them a free advertisement. What could be better than that? Let's hear the first news story. Lon. Well, the highest voted story by far, it got uh, 13 votes up and almost no votes down on, uh, on Ranker, was Twitter buying TweetDeck. TechCrunch is reporting that Twitter has purchased TweetDeck for 40 to 50 million in a deal that would include both cash and Twitter stock. Uber Media had initially been announced as maybe a potential purchaser for TweetDeck back in February. That deal was rumored in the 25 to 30 million dollar range. TechCrunch and other tech blogs are postulating now that this is a defensive move for Twitter. They don't want to risk uh, having to go head to head with TweetDeck or any other major yeah. competitors. So my question to the panel would be: uh, First, what are the general thoughts on this deal? And is this just Twitter's strategy moving forward? Wait for any potential third-party clients sure. to come up and then just buy them out. Hey, Marshall, uh, what do you think? You've been covering this, I think. Oh, this puts a knot in my stomach, to be honest. I love TweetDeck. I spend all day long uh, with it on, and it's a great power users tool, uh, which would make it pretty unique in the, the Twitter tool set and uh, at Twitter HQ because they have not taken a lot of steps uh, in favor of power users. So I'm, I'm nervous. Ah, you actually think the product, after being purchased, will be neglected and, and maybe not get the care it needs, and you're going to need another power tool. Uh, Rob, any thoughts? Oh, if they dumb it down, they really run a risk because they'll lose their power users. Right. The problem that Twitter's had is it's so diffuse, right? So there's no concentration. You've got yep. also this kind of ultra power law where there's a tiny number of people who are super active, right. and then there's a gigantic number of people who are hardly active at all, not much in the middle. So you got a new CEO, he's got to make a dent, right? I'm sure his sure. investors are saying, hey, show us where the money, show us where the value is. Well, that's is. why they brought him in. And yeah. so he's going, oh, where can I circle up a little bit of value? I'm going to go get the power users. So he kind of bought his audience back. You know what it reminds me of? I was thinking about this on the way over here. Remember when uh, News Corp bought MySpace? Yep. It was a little late in the game. That right. was basically a move where they said, gee, our TV audience, the young TV audience just disappeared. Right. Let's go buy them back at a huge premium. Right. They didn't manage to do much with it. I don't think right. they had a great vision for what to do with it. Yep. So that kind of fell apart. It didn't work out to be such a great acquisition. Hopefully Twitter will manage this better and not lose their best customers. Tyler, thoughts? I think they have, uh, to Robert's point, <clears throat> the monetization piece is going to come from building tools for the marketers that want to reach you know, 16-year-olds sure. in Poughkeepsie that are talking about Coke. Pepsi wants to market to them directly somehow. And the, the way that um, uh, TweetDeck is kind of built might allow them a, a jump start in getting that ah, product. Ah, so you're off. saying actually make that, keep that as the pro tool mm -hmm. and add TweetSense into it. Right, and, and kind of build off of it in terms of this new platform they want to do for uh, marketers. Here's some inside information that I don't have. I just want to be clear about this. I, I have a small angel investment in Uber. Mm -hmm. uh, because Media. Uber Media, right. because the original idea there was to sort of create a, uh, a list of you know competing with the internal Twitter uh, auto follow list. Right. And so Bill Gross told me, oh, you know, I had this idea for a company. It's based on one of your blog posts, and I put a little bit of money into it. So I have a, no insights. Bill didn't tell me anything. But what I heard from somebody on the other side was that Uber Media was in negotiations with mm -hmm. TweetDeck, had an exclusive period. Twitter found out about it, and right now Twitter has it in for Uber. Remember, right. they shut down two of their clients. Uber, so Twitter. There's this cold war going Twitter on. The and then Uber is saying, and again, I don't have any inside information on this from Uber, but I do have another contact outside of Uber who's on the sort of TweetDeck side of this. Right. TweetDeck had an exclusive negotiation period with Uber, let it expire because Twitter found out about it and told them, let it expire. We'll We're going to talk on day this. 31. Uh, so that shows you how serious this is getting. Uh, I'm going to guarantee right now that there will be a Twitter coexister competitor that will basically syndicate the data and replicate the username structure. So imagine I took, you know, I own the domain name 20.com and I just said, you know, I want to have a professional version of Twitter. Anybody who, any names that are already taken in the Twitter namespace are reserved for, you know, a year for people who want to join. Other ones get bought out and you can just go claim it at 20.com and I'll have this professional service that just works better. It has longer tweets, it has photo embedding, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Somebody will do that to Twitter because they're not moving fast enough on critical issues. And I think that's what this is. Uh, what's nice about it also, they're being nice to the ecosystem. So I think that this is a way to show the ecosystem that they're not being total jerks and gonna compete with it's the people who- them, if you design something great and it gets you big will get enough, paid off. we'll buy you. Which is a sort of nice way to do it. You look at how Zuckerberg does it. He's like, mm -hmm. oh, you guys left to do Quora? I'll do questions. Right. Oh, uh, you know, Twitter doesn't want to be bought by Facebook? We're going to do status updates. Right. You know, mm -hmm. it's like Twitter's 
um, Facebook's like the Facebook's, new Microsoft. Right? They're very much like <laughs> right. the new Microsoft. They're like, and, and you know, you know, they had that conversation with Zynga. Like, okay, Zynga, either you pay f with you know Facebook or coins, we do Facebook or we're going to go gangster. Yeah. And um, so I think it's a good move on Twitter's part. They need to build back a little bit of the good faith with the developer community because they've been kind of jerks. Well, right. They've they've been increasingly sort of two faced about it and telling them, oh, well, keep doing it, but here's the things you can't do. Well, here's what happens. You have Jack, who was the original CEO and the mm -hmm. creator, and he's very pro ecosystem guy. You have Evan, who's very pro ecosystem and also pro making money. Right. And then you evolve to Dick Costolo, who is a mercenary, great guy. Listen, if I could hire him as the CEO of Mahalo, I might. Um, mercenary guy who just cares about revenue. Right. And product be damned, he's going to make that company sing. Um, and so you just watch that evolution. Right. And the developers are watching that evolution too. They're savvy. And that's why they brought Jack back, was because they needed to build back cred with that developer community. Like, hey, we're not going to screw you, and this is a major olive branch. Because mm -hmm. people, I mean, let's face it, you could recreate TweetDeck in a month. You know, I mean, Zuckerberg could recreate it in an afternoon. <laughs> can, yeah. Can, get you gotta recreate getting all those users onto that platform, though. Okay. Anybody else got feedback on this? And I next think. story. Next story. Uh, coming in at number two, a close number two, Discuss. They announced a $10 million uh, round. Mm. Northbridge and Union Square Ventures have participated. Uh, they'll bring a total of $10 million to the commenting platform. Discuss co-founder Daniel Haas says the company has $500 million unique visitors per month over the 250,000 sites currently utilizing the system. According to Ha, Facebook comments have been live now for two years. The recently added widget has not affected their growth at all. So my question is, is that overly optimistic that Facebook is not really a threat to their business model, uh, or do you think Facebook comments are going to have a long-term impact, and what can the company do to possibly sort of offset that? Uh, Marshall, what are your thoughts? I love Discus. Uh, we use it at ReadWriteWeb. It is so beautifully feature-rich, and they just keep building it out. They're really agile. They added at replies. Uh, and cross-network threaded conversations this morning, for example. It's really cool. Uh, I think they can they can move that much faster than Facebook can turn around the battleship. Um, and I think that uh, the publishers are, are going to have a, an interesting choice between the, the traffic bump of Facebook and the rich data and complexity of Discuss. Uh, and then somewhere in the middle there, there's Echo, uh, you know, JS Kit that's trying to do a little bit of both, some of the, the stats and the data and the, the traffic bump, uh, largely thanks to Twitter. So I think, it's, I think it's real interesting and just the beginning of that contest. So Marshall, you watch Facebook uh, comments appear on TechCrunch. What's the internal discussion inside of WeWriteWeb? Do you go, we're making a mistake, we need to move to be competitive with them? Because it seems like, to be honest, TechCrunch had the worst trollish comments. And now they have much less comments, but they're much better. There's like 25 good comments instead of 250 bad ones. Right. Because so, nobody wants to just well, troll. Well, the insane people are gone. You're not going to troll yeah. with your real name. So what's the internal discussion uh, at ReadWriteWeb? Well, that was our thinking at first as well, uh, that it was a, a real smart move on, on TechCrunch's part. But we have seen, and I think other folks probably have as well, that, that there's still some amount of trollishness that goes on uh, any place. But one of the critiques that has really resonated with me has been that it's important to give people, uh, for all the problems that trolls can provide, uh, it's still important to give people the option of anonymity so that they can engage in conversations uh, you know, with safety when they're in a, in a place where, uh, where having their name associated with a comment isn't something they want to do. I mean, just yesterday, for example, uh, I had someone uh, post a, a comment on one of my posts and link out to his Facebook profile and make no mention of the fact that he was a, a high-level product manager over at Google. Um, and, and I've mentioned it in comments, and it was good, good uh, context. But I think there's something to be said for giving people some freedom to, to speak freely outside of their jobs in an official capacity, too. Rob, um, you've worked on identity stuff. Would yeah. Facebook just add a checkbox that says make anonymous? Well, that's an interesting idea. They haven't done it so far, and it's actually one of the things that keeps Facebook not civil but courteous. Yeah. Uh, I think you can see, I, I have a different view on this whole situation. My view is that I'm thinking about this as an exit. Somebody clearly thinks this company is going to be worth $100 million. Sure. And so the value they're clearly seeing is that they're going to somehow Shanghai or co op the communities of all the many websites, the sure. hundreds of websites that have bolted Discus in. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I were a publisher, that would cause me some concern. I'd have to make a decision ah. there. Do I want to have, 
the hassle of running my own community, running my own message, it was definitely, there is some work there to integrate yep. that, manage it. Sometimes you have to moderate it. That's expense, and you can't really monetize well, yeah. it. And if you, or should and I push it so, out the door, but then run yeah. the risk that these guys continue to add more and more social features, and then somehow, somewhere or another, someone buys them and then manages to migrate my community away from my published content. That's a real challenge. And what is discussed as business models, the other one. I and no I had a discussion with one of the founders when I was at South by Southwest, and I told him, and he was like, hey, what do you think of our situation? And I said, you, you have to do one of three things here. Number one, you have to create an ad network and then offer me as a publisher the ability to turn on ads there or not and give me 80%. That's great, yeah. Um, and then you would have the entire network. So you have RewriteWeb, Calacanis.com, Launch, and 10 other blogs about technology or a thousand other and you sell their comment section with text ads in it. Great. How about a membership program where I could say, just like I'm doing with the twistlist.co to become a producer, hey, if you want to post comments, uh, you need to pay $10 a year. And commenting is a, you know, a, priv uh, a privilege, not a right. At least on my site, you want to comment on your site, that's your right, but not on my site. Um, and I, I said, why don't you do those two things? And he sort of smiled and he said, um, we would never do we, we, we don't think we'd ever do the paid subscription model, yeah. which was a total tell that right. he answered that first and skipped over the one with the ad network. Uh, you heard it here first. Discuss, we'll have an ad network. Uh, <laughs> Tyler, they, um, <clears throat> they've done a bang-up job Tyler? of every time you comment on a blog that does have Discuss, of getting you to realize that this other layer exists of your comments and the other people. That are, they've done, a from a product standpoint, uh, much kudos to whoever's running that ship over there. It's, it's a well-done product. It's a very well-done product. And they seem to be the pro-publisher. Uh, like, these are your comments. It's your community. We're not going to hijack them. And I think their right. terms of service is very much designed that way. Whereas with Facebook, I mean, you, you have to be very careful when dealing with a company like that. Because I do think that they don't look at it as, you know, you're there based upon they're letting you sort of participate in their ecosystem. Yeah. But it's just, like I mean, I think that the problem with all of these, and it sort of ties into both the Twitter discussion and this, is it's just where the people are. The right. whole product lives and dies by where the people are, and the people, people are on Facebook. Yeah. I mean, if you feed your comment in on a blog to Facebook, you're going to get other comments from people in your network who've never even heard of that blog you were on, and that uh, won't happen with, with it's Discuss It's going to actually make discussion at Mahalo, because I do have people at Mahalo who are sort of anti-Facebook developers, and the developers mm -hmm. have put up a lot of resistance because they built their own commenting system, so they don't want the Facebook, and then they start seeing sure. Facebook driving a lot of traffic to Mahalo now and to our videos. So there's a camp of them that have embraced it, and there's a camp of them who are like, we wrote all this great code, what do we do? And it's, I think this, this discussion is going on everywhere. Oh, yeah. My solution is, I think that people should put it parallel. So I think Discuss should make a feature called Syndicate to Facebook and then break Facebook's mm -hmm. terms of service and you allow people to have a Facebook commenting system and they just scrape those things and put them into Discuss without Makes permission sense. and just be like F you <laughs> to Facebook and then let Facebook say to the publishers, oh, we're going to turn you off. And then they have basically forced, the same way Google said, hey, we're not, we'll allow you to look in our address book if you allow us to look in your address book when we build our social network. Right. And right. Facebook was like, no deal. Yeah. And they were like, great, you can no, no longer authenticate with it. That's the approach that companies have to take with companies but like it, Facebook. It's a, pris it's a classic prisoner's dilemma. Absolutely. Every company has to take that stance or it doesn't work. It's just you're left out. Well, that's why I think the parallel works. You put That's what I told my guys to do. Oh, you're in love with your commenting system. Put our comment system on the right and put Facebook's on the left. Mm -hmm. People who are already logged in Facebook will comment there. And then people who are anti-Facebook will comment on us. And let's see which one gets bigger. It's obvious what's going to happen, but at least you have both options. Right. What did they say the use of proceeds is? So here they raised ten million bucks, and they got to tell their investor what they're going to do with that money. That's a lot of cash, right? For a company that's already got a good product, so I would wonder if they wouldn't be trying to reverse into some sort of community site that gathers all of these five hundred million uniques. They've already gotten commenting; they already have them registered. Somewhere. It would be a backdoor into a social, social network. network. Yeah, no yeah. doubt about it. An and alternative and a content-driven social network that promotes people like RewriteWeb. Right, it's a, it's a, it's, it's about the publishers that you're reading and sharing. Yeah, that's kind of a brilliant idea. Yeah. Maybe they, maybe they have that mocked up and they showed that to investors and said, hey, here's a way to backdoor into a social network. We can leverage all these blogs, 500 million mm. uniques. They're across mm. 750,000 sites. That's huge access for them. It's like giant distribution. Yeah. That's On true. the other hand, they would be like a remora, right? Because they'd be si sucking the, the, the marrow right out of all those blog sites if they were to do that depending on how they did it. And when I talked to them, they specifically said, we're not going to, they don't index their profile pages. So you can see your profile page at Discuss. They don't index it. Mm -hmm. They don't index the comments. So they don't actually try to steal SEO traffic away from ReadWriteWeb or Calacanis.com. Uh. Kind of nice of them. They don't have to do that. It's kind of a menchie move. Like, we're not right. going to compete with you on the SEO basis. 
if people want to come, and they're purposely making their profiles kind of weak. Like they're mm -hmm. not super feature rich because they don't want to be the place that you know, they don't where want your to traffic is. So yeah. where are they going to put 10 million bucks then? Because they've got to put network. in this. Okay. It's, it's definitely an ad network is coming. Jason, the, the data that, that they are capturing too is really intriguing to me as a publisher, and I think that it would be to others. It, to know who my most uh, valued and regular commenters are on my site uh, to know how long it's been since a person has been to my site or posted a comment there, to know what other sites they read. Um, that's that's data that from a, an editorial perspective, if not from a business perspective, is is really, really valuable. I'm going to ask one of our producers to go ahead and read the terms of service uh, of Discuss. This is why we have 30 producers right now and figure <laughs> out for us in those terms of service if they have the right to sell read rights readers to an advertiser. Because they're collecting your data they know who your readers are, and they know what they've what the keywords are on the pages, uh, Marshall. How would you feel if Discuss sold uh, Read Write Web subscribers or technology subscribers that uh, were reading stories about, you know, the iOS operating system, and they sold that to somebody selling an iPad app? How would you feel about that if they sold people on other people's sites with your data? Well, first thing I would have to do is ask my ad guy, of course, but uh, the, the second thing I would do is ask if I would be allowed to cache that data on my end. I mean, that's one of the downsides to all the rich, structured data that Facebook collects is that no one's allowed to cache it. And if Discus did something different in that direction, uh, then, then especially from an editorial perspective, I would find it really, really intriguing. Hey, are we going to play that sound when um, somebody uh, does a... Uh, joins as a producer during the show. That sound? <laughs> now, what am I supposed to do? If I hear that sound, I'm supposed to say the person's name? And where would I actually see their name? Are you going to put it into the chat room on Ustream? Let's put it into the chat room on Ustream, say the person's name, and when we hear that sound, we'll just stop the program we'll and say that ages. person's name. It's like an <laughs> angel getting their wings. I was thinking it's like Glenn Gary, like, put me on the big board. Put me on the big <laughs> board. I sold them. I sold them. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next show. Okay. Uh, let's stop the conspiracy theories. Right, right. Uh, well, are we talking conspiracy <laughs> theories? Let's do it. No? Because uh, the next most popular story was um, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange claims uh -huh. popular websites such as Google, Facebook, and Yahoo are little more than tools for the U.S. intelligence community. Quote, Facebook in particular is the most appalling spy machine that has ever been invented, Assange Guy said. sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> Here we see the world's most comprehensive database about people, relationships, their names, their addresses, their locations, their communities communications with one another, their relatives, all sitting within the United States, all accessible to U.S. intelligence. He's basically saying there are dashboards that are created for intelligence operatives to just be scanning these sites all day looking for whatever yeah. they're looking for. Uh, resp Facebook responded that they have never been pressured to turn over data. They would only do so if compelled by U.S. law. So they're saying if you, if you have a problem with it, yeah, blame the government, okay. don't blame us. Uh, so is Assange paranoid or is there a real threat to liberty implicit in having Americans leaving their, third, their personal information on these sites? Uh, let's pull up a picture first of Darth Lord Sidious uh, Assange. <laughs> Assange. I mean, there you go. First of all, he, he's the creepiest guy on the planet. I mean, <laughs> and the fact yes. that he is too busy macking on the ladies. <laughs> young to young read Swedish that, ladies. Is, I'll tell you yes. the problem I have with him. <laughs> this is the pro Julian Assange, come to me because I want to have you on the program. And if you don't come on the program, I'm putting Tyler in a creepy web wig like yours, and he's going to wear that blazer, and oh. I, I'm going to interview Tyler as if he's Julian I Assange. Watch that and episode. I want you working on that from Delaware <laughs> at the Delaware headquarters. I want you working on that. Um, Impersonation. I'll do the next show from Switzerland. Yeah, yeah exactly. Hi, I'm Julian Assange from <laughs> a compass. Uh, he's staying at some rich guy's house. Yeah. He's sort of like and this Osama bin Laden type character. Right. I was thinking, uh, uh, like, he's on an estate. I think of Blofeld from the from the Bond movies. You remember, like Donald Pleasance, yeah. like the head of Spectre. That's how yeah, I picture yeah, yeah. Assange. He like, were, uh, he's spinning around in this chair. It's sort of like the Christopher Walken one in the one where they were going to blow up Silicon Valley. Remember that <laughs> View one? View to a kill. View to a kill, which was awesome. He needs a white cat. Oh, Bond. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Gonna... That's how I pick. That's how I picture really in my head with the white cat. But this is this is the problem. With the chairs. Mister, Ass this is a this is a message to Julian Assange. Cut this message starting here when a super fan and then send it to him. Mr. Assange, you're too busy macking on ladies to read the WikiLeaks. Stop macking on ladies and read the WikiLeaks before you leak them to see what's in them. That's what the whole problem I have with the guy. Anyway. Um, but look, the fact is, he's got a point. And the guy might yeah. be kooky, 
but he's been right more than he's been wrong. Oh, yeah. And he's absolutely, you know, people don't understand what he is. He's an oracle, right? He's the guy who's going to tell you what's coming next. So, of course, he's an outlier. He's a little weird. He's not like most people. That's why he's able yeah. to see things from a different view. He's got a very good point here. I check this out. Here's what you get when uh, when the police subpoena Facebook, which happens all the time. Yep. Here's the, if they go through the regular subpoena process, they get your user ID number, your email address, the date and time of your account's creation, your most recent logins, your phone number if you gave it to them, which most people do if you use a sure. mobile phone, right? Uh, your, your your profile contact info, your mini feed, your status update history, your shares, your notes, your wall posts, friends list, groups. List. I mean, it's everything. It's they basically give you everything. Exactly. And right. you know that they're getting thousands of subpoenas all did the time. Do they let it's you know when they get a subpoena, or do, they don't have to? They no, don't, they have, don't to. have to. Right. It's become and a leading law enforcement tool. It's one of the first right. things law enforcement does when they're investigating now. Now, do they have they to? Get your Facebook can we get a, oh, wow. Executive producer Kyle Lonzo, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining. Ah. Um, do they, I heard that like the law, there's certain things that law enforcement doesn't need a subpoena for and they can log into an intranet on AT&T and get what cell towers your phone has been to and just pay the hundred bucks and that this is becoming a source of revenue for these companies. Oh wow. Because they're getting so many of them. Right. Now it is tracked but you don't need a subpoena is what I heard for a person's phone, and I watch Law and & Order, and they do that all the time. They don't need a subpoena. They're, they are constantly triangulating on yeah. Law & Order now. They don't yeah. need your, so can somebody, a producer, then go look that up? Because I don't think they actually need it. Now, there should be there should be some level of law enforcement access to this information when needed. But I feel like, honestly, it should be the same rule as like if a cop pulls you over in your car. If they can see it in plain view, it's open. Okay, so if they can go to your Facebook page and, get and they can see, oh, look, Lon's been, you know, whatever, talking to this guy who we think is a criminal, we're going to investigate more. Fine, but they shouldn't be able to, like, open the trunk, metaphorically. What about if they open the trunk, metaphorically, and they can pull things that are, like, a human could not pull in a reasonable amount of time? Yeah, see, I say, I, I would think no on that. I would think reasonable right. search and seizure, just like any other so physical I, I, if place. I can, if I feel like I'm going to page down and go 10... You know, weeks back on your history, fine. But if I'm going to pull your whole history and find out every interaction, and then have Facebook rank it by the number of times yeah. I've commented or liked your stories, no. My feeling is, if I because that wouldn't be plain view. If I, as a private hmm. citizen, anything I, as a private citizen, could go see on you, your private citizen's page, a cop can do that too. But beyond that, no, they shouldn't be. They, that that's a legal search and seizure. Uh, Marshall, what are your thoughts on all this? Oh, I think that that the instrumentation of our lives of turning you know actions and locations and relationships into data is going to have all kinds of different consequences you know this just being one and perhaps one of the most obvious and one of the scariest but i think that plain citizens in casual everyday activities are going to be using bots and automated systems as well so the i'm sure the cops will do that and i i'm hoping that the the net impact of all of this data about our lives is going to so outweigh uh, these concerns that uh, the, the upsides combined with some smart policies for for privacy and data protection are, are going to make us look at, at uh, these fears in a rearview mirror and say, thank goodness we got all that figured out so we can enjoy the, the bounty of opportunity that comes from a, a giant wave of data. Yeah, my concern here is that this is a smokescreen. This controversy that lingers, continues to linger around uh, Julian Assange distracts us from the fact that since 9-11, since the federal government has gone on a tear, gathering up as much information as it possibly can, intruding in our lives in ways, really, that are unconstitutional because they are Absolutely. illegal search and seizure. The federal government now, the NSA, is gathering 1.4 billion emails a day. That's according to the Washington Post. They had a big article last year yeah. about this privacy. This is the, the stuff the EFF government. has been talking That's about. That's exactly right. They so. have spliced the line at AT&T, and they have a fiber line going into NSA, and they're taking every piece of data. Correct. And, and Americans don't know this. Well, and the Chinese government has shown that they can reroute traffic through their servers and do the exact same thing. And that they can hack... Uh, not, G, they can hack Google, right. and that's the whole reason Google's not in China. So and does that mean, it, ergo, that the Chinese now have all this information as well? I think it's safe to assume that all your data that you're publishing and sharing in social sites is being gathered, whether or not those sites are participating. I think the thing that's not only is it unconstitutional, it, how could that possibly be effective? You would think targeted surveillance is what's going to work. No, 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 no. Fighting no. terrorism. Incorrect. You're just just Incorrect. spying on everybody no, 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 altogether. No. What Let can me you tell do you with that data? Oh, I'll tell you what you can do with it. 
you don't, it's sort of like dark matter, like they're finding all these different universes. They don't need to find that. They can see what's reflecting on the area around it. Right. So you yourself as, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Lon Harris with the beard, it's getting close, flips and he becomes an Al-Qaeda guy. Right, but then you know, like ah, I can't handle working for Jason Calcatus anymore. I'm going to become an Al-Qaeda <laughs> That's guy. That's it. That's it. I've got a capitalism now, is a now, fraud. you go underground. However, people around you are sending signals about what you're doing, and they say something. Lawn, Muslim, Muslim, this, that, 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 Muslim curtains, whatever. And they know around these mosques, around these communities, like, hey, all these people checked into a dance club, except for these four people, and you know, they're sort of tracking an entire Muslim community. And those people all have phones. They start tracking what towers they're hitting. You don't think that they can figure out by the towers you're hitting, the Facebook likes your friends have, and the tweets that they're doing, maybe where you're at? I mean, they're going to start figuring out who I, I, is I mean, off the grid and who's off the grid, which we saw with Osama bin Laden. No phone line. <laughs> that's a tell. But I think that's no so internet. interesting. That's a tell. But what's so interesting is we found Bin Laden through the oldest. It could have been a 60s spy movie. It was a they phone call. They got through these couriers, and then they worked on the those guys The courier was while. on a phone call. Right. So that's how they got it. So, But the, it's not It's not like he was on Twitter and well, they knew people the around answer, him. The well, answer they, is we don't know but what's been it, stopped because of this technology. In North Africa, you've had all these sort of you know, so-called Twitter or, or Facebook revolutions right. that have been happening. And we hear a lot about people using social media to organize these autonomous groups that protest yeah. and so forth, right? They're but in the, a database. But the flip side of that is, yeah, this gives the government a terrific way to see who yeah. the leadership of those organizations right. Well, are, yeah. right? That's what I think Who's this the most is really reflected about. in the Twitter Egyptian resolution? That's, oh, it's the Google guy? He's going to disappear for a couple to me, days. That's, yeah. what, that's what this is about. This is not about law enforcement. This isn't about preventing terrorism. This is about the government getting to figure out who's going to protest, who's a dissident, who they don't like, who's saying things they don't like. That's what it's really about. It's really power and control. It's not All right, uh, producer Hunter Owens. I don't know what level producer is, but I know Hunter Owens is a great producer. The U.S. Department of Justice has funded tests of which mobile device acquisition tools are most effective in forcibly extracting information from iPhone. Read more here. Um, They're saying the, the Department of, of Homeland Security has publicly asserted the right to copy all data from anyone's electronic devices at the border, even if there's no yeah. suspicion of or evidence of illegal activity. This is why I had Brian on from Disconnect.me last week, and I'm mm -hmm. probably going to invest in that company because I just love what he's doing, and I, I already made the open offer to him at the, at the launch event. This is going to get more and more important. People need to understand their rights. They need to get on a VPN. They need to have phones that when you know, somebody goes to the fifth time to... Um, unlock them, it destroys all the data on the phone. I mean, I know it sounds paranoid, and that was, I think, your one of your ending questions there is Julian Assange paranoid? Should yeah, we be paranoid? Like, well, well right, obviously, the dude's paranoid, but the dude has access and he's right about a lot of information. That's so, it. this is what I, I like the fact that, and I was busting Julian's you know, chops before. Right. I love the fact that there's a Julian Assange in the world. Yes. I wish he was less creepy, <laughs> I wish he wasn't taking you know his condom off while having sex with women or whatever he did allegedly <laughs> you know, i mean there's some weird stuff going on with the guy a little, there's, there's i mean and then he's unsavory. with two different women in the same 48 hour period while he's on a trip i mean who is this guy you know like there's that and then if, stuff about him and then both of them report a, a rape service. after the fact and after they talk to each other like i'm not saying he's guilty of rape i'm not saying he's not i'm what i'm saying is who is this guy that he's got all of this stuff going on around him? I mean, you're, yeah. when you say James Bond villain, like, there's something insane about this individual. Tyler, let's wrap this up. <laughs> um, Give it, us an insight, it, for the, the love of God. It is. It's like a what at what. It would be like giving a blank to a blank. It would be like putting blank in your coffee. Come on, help us out here, because we are lost. Marshall, while he's thinking of an insight, tell it's us like, what to think. It's like climbing a cactus. Insight from Tyler. <laughs> It's like climbing a cactus. Yeah, like so. Unpack for us. Yeah, like, please. Un unpack away. Because a cactus is not something that you would want to climb because it's got spikes in it. How, how would you go about it? Yeah, things are going to fall over if well, you no, try I mean, how do you, how do you strategically plan to climb the cactus exactly? It's just not going to happen. Right. How, the, the government's going to do what they're going to do. Like, right. what are you going to, you know? The point that Lon touched on, which is really interesting, is interestingly that no. Post 9/11 tragedies in the U.S. have really happened uh, in nine and a half years. Right. They have happened in England and Barcelona. Right. And actually, the guy there's a whole cover no, up. The no, Fort Hood guy no who Muslim shot people. Muslim terrorists right. have no, 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 orchestrated no, no, no. a large attack. Uh, there's been contraire. shootings and public shootings and right. anthrax. Well, au and contraire. The anthrax was an American, number one. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Clearly. There's still terrorism. So that was just a psychotic guy who wanted to and put what, out fires that he created. Was he number not? two? The Fort Hood guy yeah. is absolutely an Al Qaeda operative. 
He, he may be an inspired Al-Qaeda who went backwards and reverse engineered his way into it, but that was a guy who I'm just saying we, was mentally unstable and inspired by Osama bin Laden. And of, we don't consider that a terrorist attack. Our measure of what's a terrorist attack is really off. We usually, it's, it's, it's got to be like foreign plots, and it's got to be this big showy planes into buildings. Helps and if actually, the person's brown. There's there's terrorist yeah. terrorism and public crime going on all the time. All right, we got this is going to, we're going off on a tangent. Marshall, yes. what's your last thoughts on Julian Assange being creepy and or the spy machine that is Facebook? Yep. Uh, last thought is WikiLeaks uncovered, for example, evidence that U.S. climate change negotiators were looking to blackmail climate change negotiators from other countries that were being more proactive about uh, greenhouse gases so as to, to advance the U.S. agenda. And, and it, you know, that's one of just I think that's thousands a Michael of revelations. I think that's a Michael Crichton book. <laughs> <laughs> this was the opposite. Michael right. Crichton was like, people who believe in climate change were blackmailing people. Yeah, I got about a hundred... I got 100 pages into that book, and I put it down, and I was like, I think I'm going to read Airframe again. Yeah. Uh, next story. Uh, next story, Justin TV's Social Cam hits the web. Video sharing hmm. app Social Cam from Justin TV launched right around South by Southwest, quickly received 250,000 downloads. Uh, the app, people are calling it Instagram for video because it lets you, you just take your phone, you can very quickly shoot videos, and then you can put them in email, put them on Twitter, put them wherever you want. Uh, since launch, the site has already streamlined the upload process, and now this week they added a website, so you now have a profile page. It's got all of your videos, uh, and currently all the videos you add are public. There is no private video option, so basically anything you shoot goes out into the world. Uh, so do you think this has the breakout potential of something like Instagram, or is there just gonna be a smaller market for people who wanna do the same thing with videos? And can this coexist with something like YouTube that already is so entrenched? Rob Tersick, what say you? So clearly it's already taken off, right? There's a huge number of downloads right away. Yeah, and a quarter of a million right away. Here's a conundrum for me. You look at this and you go, God, we just spent 15 minutes talking about privacy and how outraged and, and, and freaked out we are about right. our, someone's intruding our privacy. And here you have a feature that has no, no privacy features whatsoever, and people mm -hmm. are posting video about what's going on in their life. So it's about as intrusive and, 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 and uh, revealing as it possibly house, can be. House, right, exactly. With, yeah. And no choice. There is no private choice. If you so consumers clearly are sending there. two signals here. One is that they care deeply about their privacy, and on the other hand, they don't give a shit about their privacy. So you have yeah, the. Yeah, uh, they don't care when uh, it helps them get laid. And they do care when it embarrasses them. But isn't that everybody? I mean, well, that's all really behavior in the world. I mean, if you are at a dinner party and you tell a, an anecdote, it's either going to make you look good, bad, or something in between. Right. I mean, if you tell an offensive joke, you could take tear the house down, or you could get kicked out of the house. But I mean, there, there there can be very personal things about my life I don't mind sharing, and then things that maybe even aren't that personal that I don't I want to keep to myself. Are That's you referring, my choice. Are you referring to the cosplay? Yes, I am. Okay, you, right. Uh, Nobody must know about my Sailor Moon outfits on the weekend. Okay, Tyler. It's never a never-ending source of people's desperation to connect that all of these social systems are playing off of, and it seems there's an unsatiable appetite for people to expose themselves, you know, and they're tossing their own privacy, you know, on the roadside for the chance of reconnecting with some hot girl they met. Where, I don't it's know what. Attention, almost all this it's, stuff is it's just It's bizarre. I mean, it's I, truly bizarre. I, I love the way, Rob, you use your Facebook, which is you pose an intelligent, uh, well, you, you seem to pick whatever's the most intelligent story of the day and you pose some thoughts about it and then, what, 25, 50 people respond and I'm one of them. It's almost like, you use it as a publishing platform. What do you? It's a conversation, right? Yeah. And, and I'm trying to make it an informed conversation. Right. One of the things I don't like on Facebook is when people just randomly post stuff, but they don't give you any context. Right. And there's newsletters you get like that as well that are basically just a roundup of stories. But what I think is really interesting is, like, what did you find so interesting about this yes. story that you bothered to post it to Facebook? Tell me why. And that could be just a sentence or two. But that tells me something about the way you look at the world. I find that really interesting. Right. So this idea of just kind of randomly spraying stuff, yeah. like here's what's going around in my world, geez, filter it for me. Do me that favor, right? Filter it for me. If you're going to be a there personal publisher. There should be a delicious that when you publish something, it should force you to answer the question why. Yeah. And maybe have like sliders that says, hey, why? Mm -hmm. Bizarre, fun, whatever, you check boxes, and you have to do it, and then people would say that's an, you know, mm -hmm. some sort of feedback mechanism. They do this on the Huffington Post, right? They have this, uh, if you're going to like something, you can't just thumbs it up, you have to say what, whether it's funny or whether it's important Yeah, that's, or they something. stole that from BuzzFeed, like the Buzzfeed LLL. Yeah, it it doesn't work, nobody uses it. It whatever, doesn't get right. enough juice to make it really uh, effective. And it's I guess the problem work. is, most people don't actually have a perspective. Most people have been beaten into the position that they can't have a perspective. I mean, look how uncomfortable people got last week when I said I was happy that Osama bin Laden was killed, and that I was happy that his, his sons were killed. 
I'm thrilled that his family was killed. Well, thrilled. not his Huge family. Some of them were killed. Well, go kill the rest, as far he's as I'm got, concerned. He's got, like, you Those know, are They're all supporters. Wives. They might as well... They're, they're in cahoots. I mean, I, they, they were the ones defending him and hiding him. Kill them all. Drop a bomb. And if people are offended by that, well, then... Too bad. I'm offended that he killed 3,000 people in New York for no reason. Or for an, an asinine reason. Uh, Marshall, any thoughts? On Osama bin Laden, <laughs> family being killed. <laughs> Pro or against Osama or bin against. Laden, your thoughts? If, it's, if he's got a 15-year-old son, is that okay? Or a 12-year-old yeah. son or an 18-year-old son? Please. Well, uh, Jason, I, I will tell you that the I, I'm guessing that the terms of service would prohibit those children from using social cam uh, if they were under the age of 18. And, uh, yeah, I, I have been uh, exposing my uh, innermost thoughts and feelings on social cam uh, since the, the service launched. Uh, I really like it a lot, but it is a little bit lonely over there. Despite 250,000 downloads, um, I don't see a whole lot of activity uh, in my social graph there, but I love how easy it is. Uh, and you know what's easy to use is MailChimp, MailChimp, MailChimp. E -e 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 -e. New upgrade to the free plan now includes the ability to manage <laughs> 2,000 subscribers and send 12,000 emails per month. There's no contract, no trial, and the free plan is always free. That means they're confident. Any software as a service company that wants you to sign a contract that's indefinite or 24 months and they make you commit at a certain price, don't be a sucker because they're trying to screw you because they're not confident in their ability to keep you as a customer. You know what? MailChimp is confident. That's why I use it uh, for the launch list, for the Jason Nation list, uh, and Squill uses it, and a bunch of other people. Ohm told you last week when he was on the program that he uses it. Um, I love the fact that there's no contract and I can just fill up my credits. And I pay for this service. I am a paid user of MailChimp, e -e 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 -e. Uh, now integrated with Amazon's new simple email service uh, and the ability to handle transactional email. We use MailChimp to send the launch newsletter, as I mentioned, and you should be signed up right now at launch.is slash newsletter to get our uh, semi-weekly newsletter. You've considered doing a newsletter? I, I would read that. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Just make a text, plain text one like I do. Thing makes and sense. then just write like 100 words to 1,000 words on what you think. And round up a couple of stories. And yeah. have it... Just do one and like do it like infrequently, but then have it be from you. And when they hit reply, it goes back to you. Hey, does Read Write Web have an email newsletter? Oh yeah, we do, and we use Mailchimp. You do, and yep. I did not know that. And that's how confident I am in asking that question because nine out of ten people use it. And this, this really, to be honest, them sponsoring the program is a victory lap. They've already won, and so they're just they're throwing a little cash just to say, hey, we're number one. But they've already got all the big. Things. We're just filling in the last 10, 20 percent of people who haven't gotten to the. <laughs> haven't figured it out. Who yet, haven't yeah. figured out how awesome Mailchimp is. Let's hear the next story. Uh, the next one in line. And why haven't I heard the chime? Where's the next executive producer? I, somebody needs to go to twistlist.co, and we need to hear that chime. Go. Uh, Warner Brothers have acquired Flickster. Warner Brothers Home what? Entertainment Group purchased social movie app Flickster for between 60 and 90 million dollars. When did that happen? Uh, happened yesterday, I believe. Yeah. Oh. Flickster has raised seven million to date. According to the terms of the deal, Flickster will continue to operate independently of the WB, though it will move beyond its core functionality of movie discovery. Uh, making things even more interesting uh, is that Flickster acquired movie review aggregator Rotten Tomatoes from News Corp uh -oh. in 2010. Uh -oh. So Warner's uh -oh. is saying all Flickster properties will remain totally independent. Mm. They're going to be, quote, studio agnostic. Mm. So I'm already guessing from your tone, mm. not taking... Uh, the WWB at their word. Mm. Uh, so what what do you think? What, what's going to happen here? Is this going to be Rotten Tomatoes? Yeah, now? Rob knows more about Warner the big movie? media companies. You work with them. What do you think? Yeah, I'm less concerned about the Rotten Tomatoes. My sense is mm -hmm. they will let it be what it is. They're staying up north, or they're staying here where they live, but they're yeah. not going to be on the lot. Uh, you know, Warner Brothers have been pretty tolerant of, uh, of these online sites. If you think of TMZ, they don't really get in their way. They let them run their site and let them run it as, as they see fit. They can mm -hmm. be as snarky as they wish. That we know of. So uh, I think what's way more interesting about this is the Flickster part. You know, the studios have this big initiative underway called Ultraviolet, and now we're starting to see how no, they play on the role. No, we don't know. What is that? Ultraviolet, well, it's a good you question. You mentioned that, like, oh, yeah, you know about Project Ultraviolet. Does anybody <laughs> know what Project <laughs> Ultraviolet is? Operation Geronimo. Yeah, it's like it's, Spear. What is this? It's, it's a, yeah, no, it's another 007 yeah. James Bond kind of what term. What are they doing exactly? So Ultraviolet was meant to be their way to, uh, you know, encrypt and somehow preserve the, uh, their video as it, as it kind of rolls out onto the web. 
Now, okay. there have been all oh, kinds of... Oh, it's DRM. Of, it is a kind of DRM, but it's mm -hmm. meant to be a system that, that allows the studios to go direct to consumer. Oh. Yeah, right now, movie studios aren't direct to consumer, really. Uh, no. They go through distribution channels Correct. like movie theaters or HBO or other Ooh, channels. Oh, Netflix. Exactly. And so as everything's migrating over to the web, there's this interesting battleground happening between the traditional distributors like cable operators who've announced their big initiative mm. at TV Everywhere. They're trying to get the TV shows and the, and the movies from HBO put them up on uh, various devices so that they can kind of extend yeah. cable out virtually, right? Well, as it turns out, movie studios sat back and said, you know, in fact, those aren't rights you actually have. Right. And so everyone's been waiting to say, so what do you got? Are you guys going to go direct? Well, here we're starting to see this is a potentially mm -hmm. the front end of their service could very well be Flickster. Ah. Now, that's really important, right? Because if you think about what, you know, Netflix has just been rocking, right? Sure. Netflix is really clear. They're not a streaming company. They're a discovery company. And they've right. got by far the best way to browse and best discover reviews. movies, right? Yeah. Until they crippled the iPad app, which I don't know what mm. they were thinking. It's like they must be crippling it because of some rights or rules around I having the read, web experience on the... On the, they, the web but, experience still involves renting discs, and right. they want to totally get you away but from they, that. But you right. can't Industry. read the reviews yeah, just, and see the permalink pages yeah, of the movies anymore. They only want you to be able to look for a title and hit play. That sucks. That I was. Suck. I, agree. I, it's, I it's, used it for browsing. It's, it's, it's a much It's less, a great uh, place to browse, experience. and bookmark, and then watch it on TV later, right? Ugh. So at any rate, Netflix yeah. up till now has done a great job. I thought Amazon, when they rolled out their Prime Video service, yeah. I didn't think it was quite as smooth or as polished as Netflix. Now, I gather it's getting a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, Netflix, it's Netflix's game to lose for, video, for paid video services sure. on the web right now. But this could change everything. If Kevin Sujahara, who's running the home video group at Warner, he's a very, very smart guy. He's been thinking about this for a decade, how to roll out their video onto this, onto this online platform. And now he's got the ultimate front end. So Flickster could become their discovery, sort of social yeah, discovery social service. network. Here's what I've seen. I've seen it in movie That's theaters. 90% yeah. of my friends have seen this movie except for me. And remember, they've got something like 35 million people who already have Flickster installed in their phone. So they also oh. have some distribution power to mobile through Flickster yeah, as well. It, I have it on my phone. Wow. So what does that do to their relationship with um, the cable operator or something like that? It's a real friction-filled relationship right now. So yeah. every company in the TV value chain is starting to step back going, well, wh what rights do we actually have? What right do we have to move this stuff onto, say, the computer, the iPhone, the iPad, and so yeah. on? And they're struggling to t determine Because Netflix that. did that with stars. But they went around, that was an end run around the studios, right? and right? the studios were like, well, we're not cool with that, and they did right. it anyway. They did it and anyway. And then they told stars, you're not going to get any more candy. Well, and then they said to Netflix, okay, but when that right, when those rights expire, we're we'll waiting over. here, and we're, well, the price is going to go up. And ah. Netflix is ready for that. They've, got, they've announced they've got a billion-dollar war chest for content acquisition. Wow. So that's pretty powerful. And they gave a hundred. They, they dropped a hundred million on this. Uh, Make it a new series yeah, with Kevin, Kevin Spacey. A new series with Kevin yeah. Spacey. Yeah. That's right. And uh, how would they ever recoup that? Well, they have. Do they have thirty million subscribers. Twenty or thirty. They now have twenty-four million subscribers, which makes them that's bigger. That's almost as big as AOL. Well, check this out. It's At bigger than bucks. Comcast in terms of a paid yeah, video yeah. service. More subscribers than Comcast. And they, its average price is twenty or twenty-five. No, no, it's under 15? ten dollars. Yeah. It's like the yeah, average is under ten. You can pay eight ninety-nine, I think, oh, to yeah. get baseline. The so they Netflix have a quarter billion service. dollars a month in revenue. Yeah. They're doing great, and they're closing in on HBO for yeah. subscription video services. Which That's is, the they crown don't jewel. They need to make their money back on this first series. It's right. just a shot across the bow of HBO. Oh, just like HBO would do Sopranos and take yeah. a loss for two seasons, knowing but people are gonna come to us. Yeah, over time. yeah, loss leader. Right. Hey, so, we're not gonna do commercials. We're just gonna do Kevin Spacey's new series. Right. And I mean, you do enough of those. Do enough original movies with big movie stars. Marshall, what do you directors. think? What's your take on all this? I must confess, I've watched like ten or fifteen Hollywood movies in my life, probably. Uh, so I, I'd have to abstain from this thread. Tyler. Um, I recently, I don't, I don't, I haven't had a TV since 92. Oh, All right. You moving on. Time out. Time out. Time out. Oh, man. However, <laughs> however I, no, seriously. I, but I go see every you're new movie. You're in new, Julian Assange territory already. <laughs> however, no, I haven't had a TV since 92. However, uh -huh. I just signed up for Netflix and I'm, I've watched more international documentaries. It's like, Porn what's the last for, documentary you saw? Oh, I've, in the last week I've seen ten. Well, what's the one you like? Give me um, a recommendation. Last Train Home, the Chinese. Oh, immigrant. that yeah, was great. That great. You saw it too? Yeah. Did you see I it? Saw it? Yeah. I just, wait a second. I just want time out for a second. Do I have the most awesome people in my network or whatever? <laughs> last Train Home, eighty. Have you seen it, Marshall? I no. I'm making a note right no. now. To watch. Okay. So, anyway, he's four only out of seen five the people films. have That's seen. Like uh, four to five people at this table have seen Less Train Home, a documentary about migrant workers uh, going home for Christmas. Yeah. 
Well, or New Year's. New Year's rather yeah. in Chinese, Chinese New Year's. Chinese New Year. That is awesome yeah. and will change your worldview. But I'll be honest, 80% of the population has not seen it. Or hasn't even heard of it. But that's the the thing. That's what I love about Netflix. It's it's totally egalitarian. It's not like this is the big Hollywood stuff and this is the other stuff. It's all just on one feed. All right, so last screen, we all saw that. What's 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 another one? Restrepo. Did you see Restrepo? Restrepo. Oh, Restrepo. I saw Restrepo. Restrepo? 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 You see Restrepo? No. All right, so that's it. We got. Which one is that? We're not going to count Mark because he's weird. war documentary. The guy who made it actually just. Sebastian Younger plus the other guy. I did see it. And then I. All right, so four out of four. Here's the next. Next, next film. Next, next film. one to check out. Landfill. It's the what? What? In nope. Brazil, not... in Rio. Oh, I know about this land. Wasteland. 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 Yes. I have it in my queue. Awesome. You saw it? You saw it? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. We'll watch it after the so that's documentary. Fifty so percent. Next yeah. one. Next yeah. one. Let's go. Let's go. Um, Rob, I, what do you got? What do you got? I got one. There's one called Marwin Call. It's a little hard to pronounce, but it's about a guy. He was a regular, normal guy. Got brain damage. He was beaten, pummeled outside a bar brain damage and he ended up making this whole fake village populated with dolls in his backyard to like cope and work out his rage. Oh yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I've that's heard, my I've kind heard of doc- about that. That's my documentary. So, all, yeah. so three out of, two, two out of four have heard of it, one out of four have seen it. Yeah. Uh, it's in, in my queue. Inside Job? Inside it's Job? Yeah, just saw Inside Job. Oh, that's good. That's, that's okay, not on three Netflix. Four. That's not on Netflix. That's on the plane. Uh, check no. out The Corporation though, if you've got yes, Netflix. That one. I, I just saw it. Yeah, okay. I just saw it. Two and a half hours long. What's another good documentary? We have to do this week in documentary. Well, this is the power of Netflix, right? But I mean, this is crazy. These movies are in the movie theater for a day day or two, one weekend, right? Okay, and has then anybody seen Carlos? No. I All right, that's only available one. on BitTorrent. Oh. <laughs> you don't use that now, do you? Uh, no, but I have a director friend who gave me a screener. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice try. You have to see the five and a half hour Carlos. Can I ask an ethical question? If you bought the Blu-ray of a disc, and then you doubt, this is specific to Rob Tursing, this is an ethical question. I know you don't, mm. not going to talk for Warner Brothers or any other consulting company, blah, 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 blah. If, I, if a person, if someone that's not me, yes, someone that's not me, um, bought a film on Blu-ray, rented it in Netflix, and paid to see it in a movie theater, mm-hmm. and then they downloaded it on BitTorrent <laughs> just because it's easier than hand-breaking something, right. is that ethical? So paid for it three times. It's illegal is the issue. Well, so of course, but is it ethical? It ought to be, in my view, because okay. you bought it, right? Do you remember the original mp3.com? This is back yeah. in the 90s, sure, all right? Sure. Michael Robinson came up with this program. great yeah. idea, yeah, which lockers. was if you can prove, if you put the disc in your drive and yeah. you can prove that you, you have actually have the disc, yeah. you don't have to upload it, you don't have to rip it, you don't have to do any of that, we'll just unlock it in your locker, right? Mm-hmm. And so, of course, mm-hmm. yes, the problem there is I'm going to bring my box of CDs over to your house and right. you stick them all in all the weekend and you don't lock everything. Yeah. That was the fear. So the music companies sued them into submission, right? And they shut them down. But it was a really good idea. It was 10 years ahead of its time. I think we're coming to a point now, Jason, where the studios, the entertainment companies, are starting to realize, actually, we shouldn't be hassling people who have purchased our product. Maybe we should actually start to change our attitude to our customers. Start, stop treating them like criminals. Stop right. treating them like people we're going to prosecute. And start respecting the fact that they're willing to part with their hard-earned cash and buy at least one legitimate copy. I, I'm literally spending like $3,000 a year on movies. I, I did the calculation. because <laughs> yeah. I have Netflix on the bigger like $25 account. Mm-hmm. I have DirecTV in five rooms, four, five rooms of my house. I mean, that's obnoxious, but I do. And I have two receivers on each. And I have the, cra- I mean, I got every channel on right. DirecTV. I, I literally spend $300 a month on DirecTV. I know I'm an idiot. <laughs> Maybe 250, but sure. it's, it's literally up there. It's, it's over 200. So anyway, just call it 200. That's 2,400 dollars. My Netflix is 2250. What, what am I at now? I'm at 2,800 dollars. I go to three movies a month. Mm-hmm. 30. I go to the good theater for 15 bucks. Arc like 30 bucks. That's whatever. 100 bucks a month. Now we're at 1,200 40, That's a lot. Uh, and I buy like an idiot. I buy 30 Blu-rays just to have them on the shelf. So when I have visitors over, they have something to watch. So now I'm at another G. So 5,000 a year. Five thousand a year. Can I not be a criminal? I mean, how much do I have to <laughs> I ship? I think this, the studios, most of the people who work in that industry, or at least at the top, came. That there was a time when you just weren't expected to ever own a movie. That just wasn't part of the deal. Right. You went last to the theater. Last news story. Last news story. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about Google Analytics. A new feature added to Google Analytics this week displays load times for pages under different circumstances, okay. right. including visitor location, media placement, mm-hmm. and the technology used to sure. access the page. Google says page load speed impacts analytics, user site conversion rates, yep. as well as AdSense offer and standings in Google search Yeah, they're, they're obsessed with this. Marsha, you've been covering it. What's the story? I have. So <clears throat> that was a, a good summary of the story, Lon. Thank you. Uh, but I think beyond the immediate news, this is a sign that, that Google takes its analytics product really, really seriously. It's uh, Outside parties have said that it's been installed on 12 million websites. 
now all over the internet and I think that they're just going to keep expanding what they're measuring and make themselves all the more valuable to their business customers who today uh, aren't aren't paying for the product at all. Uh, awesome, I agree, let's go to the next story. Okay. This will be lightning round, lightning well, round, with, with one light, person answers. We're in the lightning round. Lightning um, round. One so person answers. Korean police raided Google HQ in ah! Seoul, Korea. Agents from Seoul's Metropolitan Police Agency raided Google's offices in uh, Jason, you'll help me here. Yok Sam Dong, as yeah. part of an ongoing investigation into the company's practice of collecting consumer location data. The allegations concern Google's ad mob mobile ad platform and the way it collects data on individual user locations. This was the second raid of right. Google's sole offices in a year. The last incident was in August of 2010 and was about Google Street View, which they ended up deciding yeah. did violate South Korean privacy law. Uh, I can answer this. I've been there. I know the company's neighbor and down. It's an incredible, and my wife's Korean. Uh, or you know, my daughter's half Korean. Um, they are a very nationalistic country. They take Google's competition with Neighbor and Down as like, I, it, it's incredibly insulting to them yeah. that Google would even operate in their country. Yeah. It is like Yandex in uh, Russia and uh, maybe uh, Baidu in China. Sure. There's only four markets, uh, Taiwan, uh, with Yahoo, because Jerry Yang's Taiwanese, and uh, Yahoo Japan, because of Masayoshi san. Um, there's only like five places in the world where Google's not number one and not welcome in a way. Right. Yeah. Korea is one of them. Yeah. And they just did some local person in, uh, some local person in, at Google in Korea, it wasn't like mandated from the top down, was like, Oh well, if you want to have your search or something on on Android phones, you have to go through this process and get certified. And they were like, "Well, we don't have our search ready, neighbor and down." And they're like, "Okay, well, we'll talk to you next year. We're going to launch our phones." And they were like, "Well, that's anti-competitive." Right. And let me tell you something: when the when the Korean guys from neighbor or down go down the street to the people in the anti-competitive office, and they are very hands-on regulators in Korea. I mean, you have to have a social security number to create an account on email or Facebook or neighbor or dam over there. You literally have to use your social security number. Imagine that you went to Facebook or Twitter and if they put your social security number into use of service, they did that because people were committing suicide and because of harassment and comments. That's a whole other story. You have to act differently when you're in another person's country and understand stuff. Google has their own way of going about things and they're highly intelligent guys. And what you're seeing with their approach to the rest of the world is a little bit of a clash. Well, it's cluelessness, right? Well, you, that, that's one way to say it. It's your classic Silicon Valley techie saying, it can be done, therefore it should be done. Right. And there are different cultural norms. You come into my territory, hey, we don't do it that way here. But the techie says, hey, it can be done. And they, they want to show yeah. you it can be done. So they're running into a bit of that. There's also, come on, a heavy-duty element of protectionism here. This is Big to protect time. and foster. Same well, thing. I mean, what they're doing China. cars in Korea, too. We can't bring our cars to Korea, but they're more than happy to send Hyundais over here and Equus and this other stuff. By the way, the Street View thing, you know, a number of countries looked at that data. Because Google said, hey, we gathered this stuff. We weren't intentionally gathering it. They said, they turned it over to the government and said, help us figure out how to destroy it because we don't want it. And, and they this is just it, all the Wi-Fi networks, at, right? They, yeah, they're just driving Who around cares? and they, they, they hoovered up whatever was available, what which anyone else can do. That? Right? What do you get from well, knowing there's Wi-Fi networks? Well, passwords and people's information and what's well, in wait, their I'm email. Not, if, I, if they pick up my Wi-Fi network at my house in Brentwood, what do you, you don't get a password from that. You just get the name of it. Well, if it's an open network, though, this is the concern. Uh, so I an see, open see, network, so you're able to hoover whatever was passing through at that time. But it wasn't. Uh, now, you know, some dark-minded people would say, well, actually, that was Julian intentional. Assange. Julian would say. Julian Assange in Delaware. What do you say? <laughs> but, but, but Google's approach to it was they said, look, we got this information. They went to the government and said, what do you want us to do with it? Yeah, in the Google's UK, usually good when they make a mistake. The no. UK, they looked at it and they said, no problem. In, in Austria, they looked at it they said, no problem. Hong Kong, they looked at it they said, no problem. You haven't broken any laws. In Korea, on Kick the other hand. Kick your door down, get on the local news. <laughs> it's a local news issue. It Somebody is. wants to be on the local news. Next story. Uh, Korea is incredibly sensitive about their aerial and street because they have a neighbor who is so... Psychotic? Know, yeah. Well... Right. Yeah, use, of course. Whatever, but the, real, feel the real tension going on in Korea with the search engine space is the Android phone, which is going crazy there. It's, and then Naver, the dominant search player there, is screaming bloody murder that it's yeah. anti-competitive because they can't get themselves on. Yeah, the this is Naver who doesn't allow anybody to index any of their data. Right. And is a, is a wall guard like Facebook. 
Next story. Wait till they try to do Pyongyang Street View. That's going to be a mess. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, last one we'll talk about. Password management system LastPass announced on their company blog on Tuesday that they may have been the target of a hacking attempt. Uh, after noticing some database anomalies, the company believes it may have had password information stolen. To be on the safe side, they've asked all users to change their stored passwords. They're also re requiring users to verify their emails in order to access their passwords again. Yeah. Uh, ironically, the service's slogan is, the last password you'll have to remember. Yeah. Uh, um, so can a the last password you'll have to have compromised. <laughs> so can a service that exists only to protect private information bounce back from losing your private information, or is transparency over time going to be enough to make up for this? This uh, Marshall Kirkpatrick, tell us what say you? Bump in the road on the path to a, an exciting future of cloud services. I differ. I think there's a real challenge here. Cloud services. There, there's a core of consumers who aren't the early adopters. They don't live on the West Coast. And these people have great concern about where's their stuff going, and do the people who store it, are they care, uh, do they care enough about my stuff? Are they going to keep an eye on it? Are they going to take as much care of it as I would? You know, these are families, photos of my family and so forth. They're my information. Uh, we've seen some major breaches. Uh, this, uh, you know, the Amazon service went down. All those cloud services were offline for right. a long time. Uh, Sony's game, PlayStation, PlayStation Network, yeah. this is a disaster that keeps on unfolding. It's the, it's the journalist gift that keeps giving because you've had 100 million accounts breached, yeah. passwords stolen. Now Sony had to buy insurance today. They said be, <gasps> they're buying uh, liability insurance for people who, mm -hmm. who end up getting their personalities cloned or their identity theft happening. In, in, they're being sued for a billion dollars class action lawsuit in Canada. This is a huge issue. Maybe consumers don't care. Maybe, maybe we have reached a point where people are like, hey, you know what, it's my private data, I don't care about it. I think if we start to see a rash of identity theft emerge, because a lot of people in the PlayStation incident are for sure notifying their banks and credit yeah. cards and so forth to put a watch on it, then I think this is a real. This is really going to impact these cloud services. But there's our new trust technology factor. that it, there's technology that's existed for decades that would allow people to have a little extra protection, like RSA security, all these kind of things. I mean, is what's going to have to happen in an air in a fluid, you know, hacking environment like the open internet with more information? Why don't we all just have, you know, those RSA things where our phones Built tell in. us like here's a four digit code, and when you want to buy something at a bank, yeah, they or if you want to use your credit card, they take your picture. You have to give them that four-digit code privately. Like we could just layer. It, it's going to be a pain in the ass. But if every we transaction debate, required a text back, we had this debate ten years ago this yeah. around pretty grid privacy. PGP yeah. and the federal government shut it down because they said it was it was uh, sensitive information. It, it could be used against the federal government. They like the idea that they can go peer in the network, find gangsters or smugglers or terrorists yeah, of whatever right. stripe, right? Absolutely. So there's a lot of voices that actually want to prevent us from having that measure of security. I think it's a setback. I mean, I think seriously, and consumers yeah. start to think about. Put, trusting somebody far away that they can't see where their stuff is, someplace in a, a server rant farm, someplace where they're not well, at. What's the information? I mean, how many people that you've killed in Tekken <laughs> Fighter Five or whatever? I mean, what exactly are people? It's going to be people's credit cards, right? Is uh, the well, issue in, in, An in the Sony? Path. In the Sony issue, it's the credit cards. In this one, it's just it's like your one password to yeah, a somebody's Gmail ball, account so or whatever. It could be your oh, Twitter, yeah, your I Gmail, think your Facebook, your bank account, your, right? It, whatever. Yeah. Anything sensitive. We need. You have to, I mean, I can't get into my PayPal account because they're asking me for an old. I mean, if yeah, you, you have to mail uh, them stuff, somebody could PayPal, hack my yeah. if somebody could hack my PayPal account, I would thank them and pay them because they want me to. <laughs> please get me my password because I'm dead serious. I can't get in because they want me to give an old credit card that's been cut up and is expired. And they're like, we need. To, and then I'm on the phone with them today, like, right, what about this bank account? What about this bank account? I'm like, do I know my even know my bank account numbers? I got three hundred dollars in. The <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Oh, so I close. almost got through a whole show. So close. God, one minute and eight. <laughs> One hour, eight minutes in. Now, now I'm at twenty. Yeah. Now I'm at twenty bucks. If you cursed on the show, Rob, you, right. it's ten bucks. They told you. I got busted. Um, let's say thank you to Marshall Kirkpatrick, who you can find on the Twitter uh, at Marshall K. Two L's at the end, right? Oh, we lost audio. Wow, we lost audio from Marshall. Yeah, yeah it looks like Marshall two L's and then a K. Right. Everybody, read, read, write web, read. Rightweb.com. What a and great blog. I will blog. see you, Jason, in five weeks in New York City. Ah, uh, yes, I am doing the gentleman's debate at the Read Right Web okay. Summit thingy <laughs> right. with Nick Denton. It's gonna be a gentleman's debate, but you know the truth is we see eye to eye in a lot of things now. Our 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 clashes, mm, our clashes. Hey, Fondy, Fondy, you're saying hello. Our clashes are a lot um, less bitter than they used to be back in the day. So sure. it should be a fun, you know, fun debate. But that, what date is that event again? 
The Read Write Web Two Way Summit is at Columbia University on June thirteenth and fourteenth. And if you just visit Read Write Web, you'll see information about it up at the top of the page. And we hope that a bunch of your listeners will come and, and join Absolutely. us there. And um, is this the first event you guys have done? Nope. This is the fourth or fifth event we've done. First time I've come uh, to an event. I can't wait. Second in New York City. Awesome. I am looking forward to it. Uh, Tyler, what's going on with Squill? Mum is mum as always. Mum is the word. If you would like to uh, get a free dinner, go to squeal.com. Next time somebody <laughs> yeah. does something wrong in the restaurant, complain. No. Uh, if, everybody if go to you squeal. Have if you have friends or family S who own a, re own a retail establishment. Ah, well, that's important. Tell them to protect themselves. And protect go. themselves from yeah. bad Yelp reviews. Actually, I heard this story. I interviewed a guy who wanted to come work here at Mahalo. <clears throat> he worked in social media because I'm building a social media team since Google kicked us out of the index. Not really kicked us out, but they, they did give us a haircut. Uh, so I'm like, okay, well, I can't be an SEO master. I'm going to have to figure out this social thing. This guy told me that he worked at a social group that specialized in doing reviews on Yelp. And I said, how does that work? He goes, well, can I tell you in confidence how it works? Of course you can tell Jason in confidence. Uh, I'm not saying his name. And here it is and on the air. Yeah. <laughs> what this firm was doing is they had uh -huh. interns, a bank of 10 interns, yeah. writing reviews mm -hmm. on Yelp and other services, um, taking pictures, going to them, right. all this kind of stuff. You would never, ever, because these are Yelp elite people, know that they're doing this. Then they would write bad reviews of restaurants. Call the restaurant and say, you have bad reviews on Yelp. We can counter these bad ones by writing good ones and by voting that one down. Would you like our services for three ninety five? So that's extortion. That's blatantly. No, no. It's, well, it, it would be. They're putting in bad reviews. No, it's, I, it's, it's a like, setup. It's like a mobster going into your store and be like, oh, nice store. Here's yeah, it'd be shame. terrible if you broke the window. Wouldn't it be awful <laughs> if, if an a earthquake rock fell hit? Through? Yeah. yeah. But this is going on. Yeah, you could tell and that. And that's why that, Squeal yeah. is around. Squeal, squeal, yeah. squeal. Everybody go to S-K-W-E-A-L and solve your problems, especially for small businesses. If there's a problem in a restaurant, in any kind of local business, when you submit it on Squeal, it goes directly to the owner of the restaurant and they get back to you by text in real time. Lon, tell us about Ranker. Anything going on over there that we need to know about? Everything going on. R A N K E R dot com. It's just it's it's. So it's Ranker how it's spelled. It's Ranker how it's spelled. Well, people think not Rancor, like the Rancor the monster, monster from no, Star no, Wars. No, it's not, not that. Ranker. It's the Ranker, just like making ranks. Uh, and it's yeah, we have you know it's editorial, so we make great lists and fun lists that we send out. Uh, but you can also make lists of your own, put them on your blog, share them with your friends, mo have have your friends vote on things, right, so you can put get some it. things we on. We get there. it. We yeah. get it. What's the uh, what's the best list? I, we should watch over there. There's a funny list. We should go check well, there's out. A, there's a there's a lot of crowd rank ones where everybody votes and that decides the uh, the winner. So right now we're re-ranking the Maxim Hot 100 list. They came out with their 100 hottest girls list. We can now let you influence it, so you can actually pick your Wait, own hot. Oh, oh, so you're gonna you're re-ranking the Maxim. We're hot letting list. the public. It's the people's Maxim 100. And just everybody how does Maxim? Did you let Maxim know you're doing that? How do they feel we about do. it? We do. We always tweet the. the okay, hey, we're re-ranking your list. They love it because then it's you know people yeah. get to sound off, let themselves be heard. Rob Tursik, uh people can follow you at Twitter at Superplex. S U P E R. R P L E X. Let's get um, Rob Tursik, who did an excellent job in his first show. Everybody rate Rob Tursik as a guest, <laughs> one to ten in the chat room. Let's see some rankings in the ustream.com slash this weekend chat room. Rank them one to ten. Um, Jason, and next how week else I'm they get in touch with you? Yeah. Well, they check out my blog, robertursik.com. That's easy. And uh, next week I'm going to be up in Marin County doing a TEDx talk. I'll oh be, wow! Uh, talking Fancy. About, I'll be talking about the power of personal narrative. It's a good time Whoa. to do that. As TV the companies are starting to fragment, yeah, it's a good opportunity for people get out there, define yourself with your story, and um, that's well, happening I mean, storytelling on next is Thursday on, on in Marin County. In Marin County, I'm in yeah. San Francisco, and anybody can go to a TEDx, or you have to pay like eighteen thousand uh, dollars. They're a lot less money than uh, than a typical it's like TED. A couple hundred bucks. I think maybe yeah. not even that. Yeah, but so it's, check it's, it out. If you're up in San so Francisco, I'd love to see TEDx it. TEDx is the people's like crowdsourced version of TED. You got it. It's the democratization mm -hmm. of TED because TED, frankly, a club for rich guys. Trust me, uh, I'm not invited. I'm not invited. No, I go to, oh wow, look at Rob getting a 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, hey. 8, 9, 10. That's really good ratings. Everybody rank Lon's job reading the news. Let's get a, a Lon ranking going. Let's get a Lon ranking going. Hey, if you want to, uh, while we're ranking Lon, while if you would like to uh, be part of the special secret list where we talk about the show, how it's going and who's going to be on. Uh, it's going phenomenally. There's 30 producers on this list. It's twistlist.co. Join for as little as $5 a month, $10 a month, $25 a month, or $50 a month. When you think about what you spend money on, uh, think about the amount of money you spend on Starbucks, five bucks a day. Uh, think about the money you spent on that course in college. 
probably $1,500 to $5,000 to learn about business. You'll learn more about business in just one episode of the show than you ever did in college. I don't care if you got an MBA. We all know that's true. This is the real deal. So go there to Twist List and show your support. A lot of people tell me, hey, I love the show. You know what I tell them now? Well, if you love the show, support the show. Because it's not like I'm taking this money and going to Vegas with it. I mean, if there's a lot. Sometimes. I may I it may does take, happen. I may, I may <laughs> play the World Series of Poker for charity this year. Oh, okay. There you go. Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> Do this I the is, Doyle Brunson Charitable Fund? Absolutely. I'll be <laughs> shipping it over to, and I'll be, uh, Daniel uh, Negrano will be shipping me yeah. another 135 times. Uh, anyway, go there. Sign up, $5, $10, any, everybody can afford it, and then we're going to build a beautiful $70,000 studio. I'll show you some of the equipment and floor plans for it, and that's going to give us the ability. We may go three days a week with the show. There's a lot of pressure on me to do three days a week. I don't know if I can handle it. It's we'll, a lot of show. It's a lot of show. It's a lot of show. We went one hour and 15 minutes for the show, but it was worth it. It was a great show. Thank you, at MailChimp. Thank you, at Trotta. Everybody at your Geary to say Man, thank you. In the what the hell was, was that? that? That's a uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Atrada. Thank you, at Mailchimp, for sponsoring the show. And we'll see you all on Tuesday. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you.